I was sent here specially to try to find out how these women died. It was a job I was given. And I don't mean to leave this convent until I've solved the mystery. Well, there's no mystery in this convent, I assure you. Welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, I am basically a sinful, sinful, monastery-bound little boy today because I have a very special guest. Uh, this guest and I have been playing the game of, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? And then I'm not a busy person. So I, I was like, dude. And my guest was like, whoa, bro. That's basically the conversation. So I'm talking to somebody who you can find on the Blu-rays and you can also find on the airwaves of podcasting and in the paper words, I'm talking about Rachel Nisbet. Hello, Rachel. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's nice to finally be talking to you Dude, after yeah, like 10 years or something. We made this happen. So I have I first found your blog, Hypnotic Crescendos, and I was uh, blown away. I was like, What? This is so good. Like, I was like, man, I'm like a, a finger painting blogger compared to this. Why is the clock chiming? <laughs> Go with. Hold on, let me stop this clock. Supernatural. Folks, I remember I interviewed somebody on this show and they're like, oh, the cuckoo clock is a real clock? You don't add that as like effect? I'm like, no, that's insane. <laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> that you got like a soundboard and you're just pressing like cuckoo clock <laughs> randomly. <laughs> It would it would be the uh, it would be the Arnold Schwarzenegger soundboard. Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> I told me you say Mr. Freeze in there as well. Somehow getting like Mr. Freeze puns in. Oh my god! Can you imagine. So, talked about the blog. Please check out Hypnotic Crescendos. It's incredible. You are on several movies in my collection now. You just are a co-star. You're one of the actresses. No, you yeah, have I wish. been. <laughs> that'd be amazing. <laughs> You've been digitally adding yourself, George Lucas style. Oh my god, can you imagine? I'm trying to think what film I would most like to digitally add myself to. Hmm. I don't know. Well, it would be called it wouldn't be called nothing underneath. It'd be called something's up. What's <laughs> going on with this this fresh lady wow. in the movie? No, so I have the nothing underneath. Is that a double feature, right? It's a double feature, yeah. You, one side, nothing underneath, flip the cover over, it's too beautiful to die. And you provide marvelous commentary and i just saw i didn't even know this happened uh you and peter uh your pal do a podcast called fragments of fear yep and you guys are on the designated victim release yeah for so mondo really macabre exciting. yeah we did that and we've we just got i think it was announced like like a month ago maybe not even a month ago we were we're on the pensione pora release aka hotel what? fear so that's really exciting. So, I have not yeah, seen that taken over. in forever. Yeah, because it's never really had like a decent enough release. No. <laughs> An Italian release, right? Um, but yeah, no, that was like so much fun to do. Like sometimes when you do these commentaries because you're watching a film like over and over again, it just kind of gives you like a whole new perspective. Like I obviously like the film, but then yeah, you get to like properly delve in, which is nice. Nice. Because uh, that's what happened back in the early days when it was really hard to find this stuff. Because you'd have your 10 or 12 films, or less, and finding more Gialli, finding more Italian horror was impossible. So you're just kind of 
rewatch what you had. So you end up watching something like, I don't know, like Kill Baby Kill, like half a dozen or ten times before you buy something new to watch. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is the thing I was thinking when you asked me to do this. When I first started getting into this, like, oh, God, I feel really old now. You probably feel older. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but I remember finding your um, Shadow Meltdown blog yep. or website. And that was like, for me, What you were one of the first people that I saw that was talking about films that were more on the obscure end. Because you get so used, because like there was such a problem with kind of sourcing these films back then. And obviously it would have been more so in the eighties or whatever. I'm not trying to say like, you know, it's comparable, but yeah, like you would find someone like you're like you in your site and you'd be like, Oh yeah, somebody's talking about these films and like the more obscure end, it's not just the same like titles over and over again that you can buy at HMV. So yeah, it was really cool to like um, find you there. And now we're friends all these years later. In the early two thousands, there was no renting stuff and downloading was like in its infancy. So yeah. The, and those VHS tapes, the VHS collectors had already begun uh, scooping up all the stuff. So you had to spend a lot of money just to see these films. Like I, I just remember my first initial, like looking up stuff online and immediately having to Ray spoiled. Oh, really? Immediately, the first site I found was like, Here's all the photos of the whole movie. And I'm like, this looks great. Oh, wait, that looks important, that part. Uh, <laughs> yeah. shit. Luckily, it didn't matter. Like, Tene Bray, it is an amazing twist, but even if you know it's common, that's not the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, I just feel sorry for you because it's such a good twist if uh, you don't know. Eh. Like, it's still effective, but yeah, that would, I'd be lying awake at night thinking about that person that spoiled it for me. Uh, that Peter Neal, that magnificent son of a bitch. <laughs> I want his we um joke like knife thing, not knife razor. Yep. Quite like to do that party trick. <laughs> I would love to freaking uh, find that razor in the street and just start slashing up my throat and be like ha ha ha, and then people will be like, "That's not the joke one." <laughs> Take me to the hospital. That was a, that was a funny thing I said. No. So, folks, check out all this stuff. Just go to your favorite Blu-ray company hashtag Rachel Nisbet. You're going to find her stuff. Dude, you are a very inspiring person. Thank you very much. I feel like Just I'm not saying. worthy of such an introduction. Shit. Yeah, I'm sure some people probably aren't happy. They're like, oh, that fucking Rachel Nisbet's on another <laughs> release, ruining it with her. What was the criticism you got? Someone's like, oh, she's clearly reading from a script. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, <laughs> alright, asshole, why don't you talk for 90 minutes? It's really hard. Give That's the thing. Point. When it's It's like... I don't know. It's like you could do it off the cuff, but I've got to, like, there's so much you want to pack in. That it's, <sighs> it's that thing of trying to, like, yeah, trying to deliver the content, but you don't want to sound too, like, I get, like, you don't want to sound too, like, rehearsed, but it's difficult. I also got told I, I was everything wrong. Like, I've said this before and things, but I got told I was everything wrong with modern horror. I'm, like, a stupid American <laughs> woman. Which I was like, I'm not, I was like, I'm not American. What part of your accent gives people American? I think they just saw like a tweet, like they saw my tweets or something, and they were like, "Oh, she's American for some reason." Every episode of Fragments of Fear starts the same way. Hey, y'all, it's me, Peter, and here's my pal <laughs> Rachel. And you're like, "Hey, everybody, my name's <laughs> Rachel Nisbet." Come on, <laughs> come on. American I know, woman. but I'm sure you find it yourself. Like, you, there's yeah, there's lots of criticism here Dude, and there. But I had I had a friend. Mm -hmm. This 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 guy didn't stay a friend for very long, and I remember <laughs> bitching to him about like people's criticisms of Giallo Meltdown. The book was like the art sucks, and they're like really mad about the art. Like, there's so many beautiful uh, Italian movie posters, and he had some stupid art on the front. I'm like, yeah, but those movie posters don't capture what i wanted to do plus my wife is my art my in-house artist so go yeah, to hell kind of and stay he, loyal. he just got mad at me one day and blocked me on all forms of social media and then wrote the most scathing review of giallo wow. meltdown ever dude this guy was such a dick and <laughs> he talked about my wife being a foot artist <laughs> and, and after reading it, after, after reading it over and over again, I was like, "Oh wait, he's referring to the film My Left Foot." Oh, okay. I just thought she drew everyone like a foot or something. Yeah. And that's yeah, <laughs> she drew me as a big toe. <laughs> yeah, you're just like a foot, and then your face in the middle with a little mustache. I kind of look like a toe in real life, but <laughs> I I just couldn't believe this review. And then uh, he also said that I have a nightmare worldview, 
which is like the best compliment. I was gonna say that sounds like a compliment. I don't know what's <laughs> what's a nightmare world for you. Like was that as a negative? I don't know. <laughs> it gets weirder too. He rewrote the review saying that now that he's had his first child, he's a lot more chill. And he like rewrote like, hey, this this book's good for what it is. You know, this is like a fan book, and I'm like, which has always ever been a fan book and not a scholarly freaking publication. <laughs> But he, like, retracted his review, and then he deleted the retraction. <laughs> wow. Dude, so insane. You're obviously, like, in this guy's mind all the time that he felt the need to, like, rewrite <laughs> a review and then retract. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm losing my fucking mind, dude. <laughs> oh, people are weird. I know, that's the thing. Like, you're like, why are these people so bothered? You're like, oh, I guess there's not a lot going on. I'm actually getting, like, sweating. This is so fun. I love talking about this. Thank you for being there for me. <laughs> No, no problem, yeah. We'll just get all off our chest, right? I'm scared to even open the bag of worms of the kind of bullshit you get because you're not a male writer. Like, I can only imagine that the the sad little boys who can't handle a writer, a film critic, not of the manly gender. Like, I, I just, I don't understand. Like, sexism is, is pretty radical, dude. I want to just, break some dicks off. I, I'm so it's mad. It's such a weird one because it's like people get so angry about it and you're like, okay, like this is my passion and stuff and this is what I do and I make money, some money off it. Um, but you're like, at the end of the day, I'm just like, you know, I go with my friends, like yeah. sit and watch like shite on the TV with my husband or like do this, that and the other. It's like, I don't, like it just feels like they're so entrenched in that world that like for some reason you're a threat and it's like... I I don't know why these people like it's not just like I don't get as bad as other people but yeah you're like they're so obsessed about it and you're like don't you like have like a life outside of films like I love like I'm sure you're the same like we both love films but we have lives <laughs> as well where we do other things you know I come from a world of like underground you know punk rock music and nothing was cooler than to look up on stage and see either one one female member of a band or an entire band of ladies it was just more interesting and more exciting because it felt like this male dominated thing somebody was doing something amazing and i feel the same way about the criticism of films and like podcasts it's it's so male dominated this nerdy culture like why doesn't that make it more interesting like hello <laughs> I know you'd think, and it's it's funny as well because like the prominent women that are in that community, like people are quick to be like, oh, you know, they're trying to be like horror influencers or oh, like if women share God. pictures of themselves or whatever, there's like, oh, it's you know, they're getting like certain kind of acclaim because of that. You, like people can't win really, and then if they're like deemed as like you know too ugly or old or whatever, that's like oh, another issue. As, again, it's just I'm just find it weird. I'm like I don't I don't know what the problem is. Like surely it doesn't matter. Like I always like I say to Peter and other people, I'm like, well, why don't you just if you're that bothered, just write your own stuff. Yeah. Like start up your own blog. Like there's nothing stopping you. Like totally. sharing your own thoughts. Hey, I got into writing about movies because of one very specific book about Italian horror called uh. Brace Yourself, Italian Horror. <laughs> and that book, the dude hated everything in it. He hated really? everything. He was so angry. Like he decided to write. It felt like a part two. I, I, folks, if I have just talked about this on the show, I apologize. I talk about this book way too much. But anyway, I'm trying to think which book it is. I'm like, is it the blue one? It's called Italian Horror by Jim Harper, and it feels like a part two. He feels like he scrapped the book of like the early days of Italian horror and then started this book that was just the late '70s through the '90s. Oh, that's weird. And he doesn't like anything except for like the superstars, like, you know, Della Morte, Della More, or, you know, Fulci Zombie. Like, those things get glowing reviews, but then everything else is trash. And I got so angry that I started writing about stuff, you know, that that's how I got into it. I love that because that's what it should be. It's kind of like me. It's like you write stuff because you don't see it elsewhere or you like disagree with something. So you're like, I'll just put out my own thoughts on that. Totally. That's, I never get it though. Why would you write a book where you're just slagging off everything <laughs> that you've seen? Like to me, that seems like quite a like an angry way of living. <laughs> just like, oh, this is shite. I hate it all. I have been trying to stay positive. Um, my my, I get I write reviews for Eurocult, uh, AV dot com and. Uh, 
I, I have a few films that have broken me recently that I'm still struggling to write the reviews on a little movie called Master of the World. Right. Which yeah. is uh, a quest for fire ripoff, which how the fuck does that exist? I don't <laughs> Someone decided that was a good idea. That movie bucked me like a Bronco. I mean, it was so, I was like, whoa, oh my God. Like, I was just full of rage watching this. So <laughs> I'm trying to find something nice to say about it other than uh, the soundtrack is awesome. I love that. Yeah, no, well, that's the one thing at least you can say about it. So. You're yeah. ready on to something. Look at that one sentence down. All right. <laughs> I know it's so hard though because it's like I don't know. Like, when I first started writing, probably you're the same. Like everybody, like you got all of those kind of like trash, like humor kind of reviews. You know, where people were like, "Oh, everything's shite," but like we'll make a joke of it. Right. And then you kind of moved people being a bit more like, "Okay, let's look at a film in a more serious way or be a bit more positive." And now you've got like that backlash of like, "Oh, well, films deserve criticism," and yeah. yeah. It seems like, yeah, there's always a different view on it. It's a minefield, especially when you just yep. want to talk about opinions on, on Twitter. It's the best. Like, there's the people who think they're being attacked because they love something. Uh, there's the people who think they're being attacked because they hate something. <laughs> then there's the people who are complaining about the fights. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is the thing. This is exactly it, though. It's like this weird, like, critical culture of, like, either too negative, too positive, and then, like, the people in the middle, they're like, oh, everyone's like, yeah. And I'm not a, I'm not above getting caught up in it. I felt weird because, like, I would talk about Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 mm -hmm. as, like, a favorite, and I literally had people tell me I was a fucking idiot. Like, you're, you're a so fucking weird. moron. And so I felt really defensive. And now I'm like, shit, I don't, I don't care. care. I'm like, freaking, 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 it's, 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 it's whatever, dude. I'm like spinning out. It's just Twitter, though, isn't it? It's, oh, it's great. You, like, any, anything you talk about, someone's like, oh, that's, I hate it. Or, you know, I don't, I don't really care. I'm just, I was just mentioning a film. I don't know why you, you're getting so stressed out. And I don't like aggro in general. Yeah. So, I think, like, you know, when I see a modern film, I don't tend to ever tweet about it because I feel like that's just automatically going to set, like, all these people on me. So don't I'm like, I just can't it. be bothered with the stress. Yeah, I don't I don't talk about when I watch the, the freaking uh, Halloween kills. I'm like, nope, zipping my lip. <laughs> zipping just my lip. That. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to get into it. Yeah, it's fine, though. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's not like you're scared to have an opinion. You just can't be bothered with all these people in your mentions. You know, I... I never feel more disconnected from the horror community than I do when something new in a franchise comes out. Like, oh boy, like this new Texas Chainsaw Massacre, man, like, get me out of here. Like, people <laughs> are losing their minds over it. And I, I'm glad that folks have the energy to argue pro or con for that movie. But I'm 45 years old, y'all. I can't, I can't with this shit anymore. <laughs> I know, and it's like people are like, oh, the horror community, like, oh, the horror community. It's like, what community? Just people fighting all the time. It's like we should be united as a horror community. It's like I don't, I don't think that's like a thing. I, I'm on Twitter to find out about movies I've never heard of, and that's I follow people that are doing deep dives into Hong Kong cinema. I oh, love that's so cool. I'll never get to all this shit, dude. It's yeah. crazy. Like if you're into cult cinema and you like if if you look beyond horror, which it took me a long time to do, mm -hmm. um, when you look beyond it, it just never stops. You'll never see it all. Do you ever get those moments where you're like, oh, you know, I feel like I've discovered so much of this. Maybe there's no like, like I'm not talking about in just the whole of cinema, but like like a niche, like Italian yeah. like cult cinema, and then you'll find like something and you'll find something else. And you're like, oh, it's just like a treasure trove. You're never mm -hmm. really done. Just recently, uh, if you. Folks, follow the YouTube channel called Giallo Realm. Um, you will get blindsided by rare stuff on that channel. I don't know how he does it. He he finds stuff that just blew me away. There's a what the hell? I've got the internet. What's a what's an internet? <laughs> Let me just talk about this real quick because I was like, Bruh. I think this is a TV, a made for TV Giallo from our our pal Aldo Lado. Oh yeah, um, the yeah, I know the one you mean. It's the Crime in Via Tiulada. Yeah. Or Giallo a Stris nineteen eighty. Um it's got music that Fabio Frizzi did that sounds like all outtakes from City of the Living Dead mixed into this score, and it's just like an hour and thirty second long TV Giallo that looks awesome. Looks so good. 
good. You've got that woman at the start as well, and she's all kind of done up like a swan, and it's just got some really nice imagery. And Dude. yeah, there's some cool like TV stuff. If you look in beyond like film even and look at like kind of television productions, like Jawa mystery stuff, you can find some gems. But yeah, a lot of it's not in English, but sometimes you just watch it anyway. And the Google Translate feature on uh, YouTube, the, oh, we'll translate those uh, Italian subtitles for you. And you you click the translate and it's gibberish. <laughs> I know, it's like, it's really like I can get a tiny bit out of it. But... I'm literally staring at my shelf of learn Italian books and feeling shame because <laughs> my wife is always like, so should we get rid of these? I'm like, no, I'm going to learn it. Okay. <laughs> One day, I know it's like, I'm trying to learn Italian as well, but oh it's... Slow process. I feel like I'm slightly getting more understanding, but I think I'm kidding myself on how much I can understand. <laughs> like, I can watch this film, like, no. All you need to know is Ayuto. Yeah. It's all you need to know, brother. <laughs> and that's the thing, you just learn all these, like, words, kind of mystery words, murder words. Yeah, blood, uh, scorpion. Scorpion, yeah. <laughs> Four flies, whatever. Folks, we're about to talk about two films. I said, Rachel, please pick what we're going to talk about. And she picked a couple of doozies. <laughs> yeah, I decided to stay away from the shallow because that's what I'm kind of known for. And then I thought, we'll go for more broad Italian horror. I'm going to say you tried to. I'm going to say that Giallo is sneaking up on you. But I know. Well, yeah, <laughs> had to get in there somewhere. But yeah, I thought, well, this is a bit more, you know, like, I, it's not usually what I, I go for. So yeah, it's fun. We're going to talk about Beyond the Darkness from 1979. And we're going to talk about The Other Hell from 1981. And I say, let's go in order. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do Beyond the Darkness first. And um, I actually found a pretty fun trailer for it. Um, Italian trailers are always lacking that thing they so desperately need, which is a voiceover guy. <laughs> yeah. But Beyond the Darkness, this trailer has a guy. He's like, he's got some shit to say. So here is the trailer for Beyond the Darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are easily frightened, we advise you not to watch this film. On the other hand, Enjoy the violent emotions. This film is for you. Body of a whore, dead forevermore. Body three times, curse, pain and torture first. Body in a crypt, body hell for had it. Body ringing bell, body into hell. No one's life you save, crumble in your grave. Where did you hide her? In a safer place than in your truck. Sometimes I could kill you, Iris. Just once. I want you to make love to me before I die. You mustn't speak like that. Death has no power to separate us. You swore you'd never come back into this room again. I want to stay here alone with my mother. Frank, your mother's dead. So is Anna. Get rid of your stupid little toy. Do you understand me, Frank? No! You will, though. You'll see. You'll do it. The young girl was reported missing three days ago. When last seen, she was in this area. Did you see anyone then? No. Who are you? Police. <laughs> If you enjoy the violent emotions, this film is for you. I was lucky enough to go through my sick VHS collection, bro, and pull out this amazing... No, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't own this. <laughs> I wish I owned this. Let me see if I can open this window without 
getting pissed off at the internet. Okay, I got it. So uh, here is the VHS description of Beyond the Darkness. All men in love are a little crazy, but this film shows how love can become a horrifying obsession and turn a man into a brutal, savage, evil, and sick animal. His actions bizarre, his desires macabre. He crosses the border of sanity. <laughs> he goes beyond the darkness. That's hot. Nice. That is. Wish I could write something as good as Ooh, that. It's, uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of periods and commas. Good stuff. I like words. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is from Joe D'Amato, um, aka let me butcher his name for everyone to laugh at. Aristide Masachesi. That's yeah. I just went for it. I just went for it. Yeah, sometimes you like you just go for it or you have a few drinks and it just makes everything roll off the tongue easier. <laughs> That's how his parents <laughs> named him. They were drunk. Obviously. We just like to call him old Joe. Just Dude, easier. I called him <laughs> Joe D Amato for no, I called him. Yeah, I called him Joe D Amato for years and Jeffrey was like, "Dude, it's it's Damato." And I'm like, "Oh, come on. Just cuz you're Italian, you don't know." <laughs> Sometimes though you just see like words written down all the time that you're not thinking too much about pronunciation. Oh, like creamy. My my horrible, embarrassing um talking about German creamies. I kept saying the word creamy over and over <laughs> no. again. And somebody's like, dude, I I think it's creamy. And I'm like, oh, I don't have to embarrass myself because people were giving me weird looks when I talk about oh the creamy. giallo is oh also God. influenced by the German creamy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a freak. Oh, I've butchered so many. I've butchered so many names <laughs> oh, on <dude>. the podcast. <laughs> oh, my my friend Brad, bless him. He's like he's like it's Michele Soavi, and I'm like, oh shit! I've been calling him Michelle Sovi. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> and I actually um, got into an argument with somebody who was watching a a critique of maybe it was the sect or maybe it was. Um, uh, stage fright or something and they're like they commented like it's pronounced michelle sovi dude and i literally found an interview with an italian person in one of his movies talking about him as a director and they said his name in italian and i'm like here you go buddy and i posted that link that's how you say it and that's when i realized i was <laughs> wasting my life yeah, you're on a, lose, a losing battle there. I was just talking about how I don't get into this shit. <laughs> I know, and there you are, like, spending all your time trying to find, hey. like, proof to show someone that they're wrong. At least it was a few years ago. I'm, I'm much more chill now. My thyroid is practically in check, folks. Sorry if I got too personal. <laughs> well, this movie has one hell of a reputation because it's, uh... It's unlike a lot of Italian horror. Grim. Yeah, it's pretty much viewed as one of the most extreme Italian horrors, which is probably not an unfair assessment, really, is it? I mean, it's pretty grimy, to say the least. Dude, it has a, it has a moment <laughs> that even made me... I didn't gag, but I was like, how long ago was dinner? <laughs> no. I'm... Well, that's the thing. Like, you watch it now, and you're like, oh, you know, like I've seen it before. Like I'm rewatching it, and they're like, oh, no, it's still quite... There's like, yeah... Some pretty gruesome bits in it. Oh, yeah. But our pal here is, uh, his name is Kieran Cantor, and he plays old Frank. And Frank is just a romantic. We shouldn't judge him too harshly. Oh, his his credits are amazing. <laughs> oh, boy. Ooh. So he was in uh, Erotic Flash and Erotic Blues, which whenever you have an Erotic Flash, the first thing that happens to you is you get the blues. <laughs> The erotic blues. La Amante Bisex. Can't imagine what that's about. Mm. But yeah, he is really, this actor is so committed to, like, were there serial killer films around this time to give an example of, like, how would he find this weird performance? Because one thing when you read about serial killers is they're lame and boring. You know, you, they're not these creepy monsters they're they're obviously dangerous but they're so annoying and boring and like he just plays it so perfectly in this film oh my god yeah because he has this almost like childlike childlike nature to him yeah he <laughs> so he's in love with with uh chinzia monreal also mm -hmm. butchering her name as you would uh but she's in the hospital dying of a heart condition i believe yeah and she was like, we need to make love right now, bro, because I think I'm dying. 
and they almost get going, and then she does, in fact, drop dead. Oh, and of course, much like a psycho, a certain psycho, played by Anthony Perkins, he's into taxidermy. Yeah. Which uh, my wife was very uh, keen on pointing out. She's like, you know, taxidermy and embalming are two different things, right? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Maybe Don't ruin the illusion of the film. <laughs> Don't tell the movie that, but come on. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's not alone in his uh, his madness, this this Frank guy. He's got his iris, played by Frank Astapi. You made this a Frank Astapi double feature. <laughs> I did, yeah. I was like... You got to love Franca Stoffi. She's one of those kind of like unsung people of Italian um, horror cinema. She's so good, like in everything that she's in. Oh, like one God. look, and you're like, Oof, that's... she's like, I don't know, because she was such a nice person in real life, like really dedicated to like animal rights and like oh, helping no. people and like all these. She was so like a veg, you know, a life lifelong vegetarian. She wanted to be a nun, not like the evil nun. The other hells we'll get into, Dude. but. Yeah, and then but she can play these like incredibly dark characters. It's quite a talent, like to see how she can play like completely the opposite of who she is or who she was even. Well, I, like, I don't, I don't think she was on set for that baboon hanging from the freaking ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is the thing though. Apparently, right? She, whenever she filmed, the directors had to get her off the set because she would like try and intervene about animal rights. Oh, good for her! And that baboon was real. Of course, it was. Yeah, and uh, but they just injected it. See, this isn't a Jess Franco movie where it would have been like a stuffed bear or something with like a monkey face on it. <laughs> yeah, they just were like, oh, this, b- we'll get a baboon, we'll just keep injecting, I, I don't know how long it takes for a baboon to wake up from being um, sedated, but they just kept like sedating the baboon oh my for that scene. Well, they did, so they didn't just straight up, they couldn't afford to kill the baboon, they had to like return it to the freaking zoo later. Yeah, presumably, because that's, that's if you. Uh, it's like on that interview with Frank Astoffi on the Beyond the Darkness um, Severin release, wow. and she's just like, "Yeah, they kept injecting the baboon." And you're like, "Who? Like, I don't. I guess that's better than killing said baboon." Yeah, but I will also, give that's them quite messed up. If that's true, I will give them points. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> so they just had a vet on the side of the production who would just kind of come in and give them a wee injection. But you're kind of worried that the baboon would wake up as it was hanging from the rafters. Nice. That would that Sorry, would also be sorry. terrifying. That would be Shakma. That'd be like that movie Shakma. Yeah, Shakma, yeah. <laughs> so was, she was yeah. she was in both Women's Prison Massacre and Violence in a Women's Prison, so She was, yeah. That could have been the whole next stage of her career. She could have come to America and done some more uh, WIP films. She was in she played nuns. She kind of had a phase of playing nuns in the other hell <laughs> and the true story of the nun of Monza and then she can I suppose these, there's similarities isn't there and then she went on to be in yeah the women in prison films. Um her career kind of slowly petered out after that because I guess they weren't making as many exploitation films but it's a bit of a shame because she was really really good in all the roles she played. She she missed her chance to be in some uh some freaking uh what would it be uh post-apocalyptic she, oh, yeah, that would be funny. She could have been the one nun left in this haunted uh, freaking. I'm just writing a movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just going with it. Baboons aside, when good old uh, Chinzia Monreal, when she dies, uh, Frank steals her corpse so that he can. Uh, well, first he, ab- he injects it with stuff, some uh, mysterious fluid, which we assume is going to be a preservative type fluid, like. Uh, um, Oh my god. My I keep wanting to say morphine. What is the stuff? <laughs> well, the stuff to preserve a dead body yeah. from like I don't know. Oh my like... god, it's right on the tip of my tongue. This is so silly. <laughs> Formaldehyde. Whoa, there it is. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, Whew. I was so worried. Oh, boy, about that, that was rough. <laughs> that was that, see, speaking of getting old, just reach for those words, bro. Uh the cemetery that they filmed in looks so damn familiar. Where, where uh, her funeral is, it looks like the one from, like, Sweet House of Horrors and a couple of others. I don't know where it was. Yeah, I'm not actually sure where the cemetery is, because the film, I believe, was filmed in Bracciano, which is not too far from Rome, but I think it's supposed to take place, like, on, like, on the border. Yeah, it's, like, very North Italy on the, the yeah, border. Yeah, because uh, you can see, like, people wearing kind of, like, Austrian, like, hats at the dinner party and stuff. So I presume we're kind of supposed to be in that area. But, yeah, we're near Rome in reality. But it looks good. It looks right for what's supposed to be. It says, Schlob Ratzotz. <laughs> I'm definitely not saying that right. So, yeah, no, it's it, they've got that uh, 
the leader hose and flare going on with some of our uh some of our tertiary characters so yeah this is yeah this is lovely this i love when they just film some of these things in a weird location like you've got all the beautiful mountains in the background and a lot of this and it just uh, just feels so european <laughs> <laughs> it feels very fresh as well, you know, like when you're outside and she's like digging the grave, you've got nice blue skies, yeah. green grass. I don't know, it's I suppose it's quite like a contrast to all the griminess that's going on inside. So instead of judging Frank for his uh his corpse stealing, um our pal Iris uh, is very supportive, maybe a little too supportive, and uh, she's like, "Yeah, dude, bring her on home. We'll 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 keep her because she loves him so much. Now, is she related to him by blood? No, I think what's supposed to be is she's like the governess. So his oh, mother okay. was, you know, like the woman of the house. Um, and then Iris has kind of either brought him up or, you know, was like the housekeeper. So she would have probably known him from a younger age and oh. known his mother. So then she's kind of taking the role of his mother, like you see later, and she's putting on the mother's clothes and pearls and... She's also got a bit of an issue, though, with him and his motherly bond because she doesn't really like him being in his mother's room and no. stuff. Like early on, we see her kind of like, why are you in here? Well, leave it to a film with implied cannibalism to have implied incest. Yeah, not too much of a surprise there. And then we get that really <laughs> quite gruesome scene where she undoes her blouse and lets him suckle at her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I said that. And I was like, oh, that's just horrible. <laughs> well, I can hear my husband like coming in. In the flat, as I say, like, suckle my teeth. Excuse me? Who are you on the phone with? <laughs> <laughs> but like, and I'm like, is he getting milk out of there? Like, is she like got the, uh, has she managed to have the, uh, like the sympathetic pregnancy for like the first 21 years of his life? Because it's weird because you almost feel like, is there a sexual component or not? Because he seems to be seeing her as the mother figure, but she's obviously seeing him in this. Well, maybe she's, I don't know. It's, yeah, like say, just basically implied incest or yep. just yeah it's it's hashtag complicated yeah so and then we see her at the start like you were talking about when um anna his girlfriend's in the hospital dying and just before she has like i presume a heart attack or whatever <laughs> excuse oh, yeah. me um yeah you see iris and she's at the table with this old i was gonna say old crone that's not very nice as an old woman <laughs> and there's pictures of anna and like um francesco together and then there's like a voodoo doll yeah and they're putting the needles in and then she she dies so kind of presume there's a slightly supernatural side there where iris is trying to off anna i i really like the mild supernatural shenanigans there's the, the big moment later where it's like wait a minute is this a ghosty movie I'm yeah, I know. Yeah, it goes really gothic because I think yeah. Joe D'Amato, like in his work, like sorry, his earlier work, there's more like of a gothic element as there is to all kind of Italian horror in the 70s anyway. Um, so, yeah, we have that. I won't go into probably now, but yeah, we have a really nice gothic moment later oh, on. Yes. <laughs> so he, he steals the body. He picks up a hitchhiker who's very insistent. Uh, she just jumps in the vehicle when he's not looking. <laughs> Typical <laughs> Americans. <laughs> <laughs> While he's changing a tire. And I... You know, I don't approve of tobacco joints. I don't oh, approve no. of drug use and her bong because she's, well, she's from L.A. So, you yeah, know, she's rolling a spliff with a doobie and she's putting her bong in it. No, I'm just I'm, I don't know. But it's <laughs> obviously tobacco. She's packing into this cigarette. I'm so proud of her for acting stoned. <laughs> <laughs> like, Quite a talent. Whoa, nicotine's hitting me, bro. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> So she passes out, almost sees the corpse hand uh, from the back of his truck. I love this sequence where he just casually hides the corpse hand. Would have been very awkward to explain. And he immediately gets her back, uh, gets uh, his lover back and starts doing one of the most graphic freaking uh, embalming scenes I've ever seen outside of an actual, you know, like, embalming scene from real life stuck you in a just movie love sitting, watching embalming scene like <laughs> real life embalming i forget there's a spanish horror film 
Oh, it's called, um, it doesn't have an embalming scene. It's called Swamp of the Rais- Raisins. I almost said Swamp of the Raisins. <laughs> and then I said it. Swamp of <laughs> the name? Ravens. And um, there's a moment where they go to the morgue and they pull out a corpse and the dude starts uh, slashing the face of this corpse like, huh, see, it's dead. Huh, huh, huh. And it's like, whoa, 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 rewind. That was a real corpse. This is a real morgue. This movie just <laughs> went to like, how is no one talking about this fucked up shit? And it's just for some reason that movie stayed really obscure over the years. Yeah, I've never seen that. I don't think I've ever heard of it. It's a Spanish me. one. It's a Spanish one. It's got great. The poster art is better than the movie, but it's definitely worth checking out. And I swear that was not a fake corpse. <laughs> a, Who cares about ethics back in the 70s uh, and 80s? Do it eh. on drug a baboon. Come on. Slice off a corpse. Fine. Why but not? actually, they, they that autopsy scene was so realistic that people thought it was real. Hey, they did good matching that pig uh, with uh, her, her skin tone. <laughs> because he, as soon as he starts cutting, you see the fat separating and you're like, oh boy, this is where the bacon's coming from. <laughs> but the moment that gets me is when he uh, dr- um, pumps her brains out like the uh, the Egyptian style. Yeah, with the chibs. That is the scene where I was like, oh boy, that's rough because it's just so chunky. I know because it's like you look at it first and you're a bit like, it's like blood and you're like, oh no, there's the like... The chunks. Oh my god! And you've just so... had like the like the, the guts and the heart that comes out of the or middle. It's yeah, it's pretty graphic. I don't know. I, I I'm trying to think what a modern audience would think of it, but I, I do think it stands the test of time. It's oh, it's unsettling. Unpleasant. And hey, you have to have a trigger warning for people who are scared of bony hips. <laughs> you're gonna get you're gonna get bruised up when you're necrophiling it. I'm glad I said yeah. that sentence out loud. That was good. Yeah, you were you were hesitating on that one. So uh, the the our our pal the uh, hitchhiker wakes up, sees him at his at his uh his work, and instead of trying a little harder to escape, she decides I can take this guy, <laughs> and tries to attack Frank and scratches oh. him, and he's very much about um you know the punishment fitting the crime, so he rips her fingernails out. And I gotta wonder, is this the first time this has happened in a horror movie? 1979. I mean, I kind of feel like it must have happened before, but I have a, like I have a proper phobia of this. Like oh, I hate course. anything with fingernails; it's disgusting. And like it makes makes me wince so much. When a screenwriter has fully run out of ideas, they do the fingernail ripping thing. I, I just hate it. It's not even a thing that. I'm, I mean, obviously, I don't want that to happen to me, but like, I just, I just, I hate it in a movie because it's like, yeah, all right, we're doing this. I am just down on the torture in movies. Like, obviously, if it's, if I know that it's going to be a torture film going into it because of the plot, I don't want to get sideswiped. Like, like, uh, was it, was it Good Night Mommy? Yeah. We're like 45 minutes of that movie is torture. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> ah. I know because it doesn't, the like, yeah. Sometimes it just sneaks up on you. We're all going to super glue our mouths shut after this podcast is over. Ugh, I'm no. just looking at my fingernails now and I'm like, just thinking about someone ripping them off. Rachel, leave them. Leave them in your body. <laughs> They're God's gift. You know, but sometimes I get paranoid. I'm like, oh, people, if people hate me as a film critic, maybe they'll find out where I live and like rip off my fingernails. So I've said, like, I don't like it. And then I'll be on the news and they'll be like, oh, film critic's dead and was killed like in a way that emulates like beyond the darkness. And my brains will just be in like a fragments of fear mug. They will find you. <laughs> they, I, I would, we would all drink out of that mug. That's beautiful. <laughs> no, they, they'll they come to your house and they'll do the, the nice nails. They'll give you a nice... Uh, Manicure. manicure yeah so. that'd be nice it, but yeah. it won't be a style you enjoy it'll be really tacky and you'll be like all right thanks yeah so yeah that might be worse maybe i'll just get my fingernails ripped off rather than have like a tacky <laughs> manicure oh my god so he kills the hitchhiker uh by doing my favorite thing in giallo movies which is uh the three second strangulation or three second su- suffocation like yeah it's a good thing people aren't this easy to kill because <laughs> She, all this torture she goes through and then they're like mm, ah, that was three seconds stop she, we got this she's clearly dead she's done <laughs> or you know maybe she had a, a chronic breathing problem from all the she had emphysema from all the yeah she could have done you never well oh, yeah exactly all the joints 
<laughs> so, first explanation. Ever the enabler. Um, Iris helps him chop up the body. And I am just like, this woman is beautiful. You know, you've got Chinzia Monreal, who's like this weird skinny statue. And you've got this like robust Italian woman who is like so proud of herself and like you go girl because she has like no tan lines and i'm like that's so impressive like ah i I love that this movie shows that women have different kinds of bodies rachel (laughs) i might be thinking that made you feel happy yeah you're going in some sort of like we could there's a yeah i make an argument about portrayals of different uh female (laughs) forms and beyond the darkness (laughs) ahead of its time ahead it was of ahead time. of its time god bless him yeah I, I totally got myself into a corner there i didn't <laughs> i didn't know how to get out but um so they cut up the body and only he gets to wear the cool mask to keep from dying from these acid fumes that's not cool yes yeah, because he's a bit of a wuss but she's just straight on in with her cleaver hacking away blood all over her face yep. that's probably one of the most like the most memorable images though isn't it it's yeah. just like her chopping off the arms she grabs the head throws it in the bath just you know when she's I, a woman that gets things done when i did screenshots from this movie because i reviewed this years and years and years ago i i mm-hmm. had screenshots from this and that moment of her getting the blood spraying her in the face was just one of the first ones i took it's so good i mean yeah it's great uh, that, that this movie oh my god i love when joe damato says cinematographer pff, i'm that guy and the director, because he always brings it. Ah, we'll, we'll get into that when we get into that. Yeah. Uh, then we have my the, the implied uh, cannibalism scene, <laughs> which I wrote in my notes as, girl, I love watching you eat. Lovely. And, and I just full on assume that she saved some of the hitchhiker to chomp on, but we don't see that happen. Yeah, I know. It's that kind of thing where it's like, could it be something? Maybe it's just normal food. Who knows? <laughs> but I do know in real life it was soy because she's vegetarian. Dude, that's so cute. And it, it, so, it, yeah. it adds to the movie because it's so you're so deep into this weird, claustrophobic, disgusting nightmare. And I bet people got nauseous watching her eat. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because it's really does. grotesque. <laughs> and like. You can just because you've just I, I love the like contrast where you've just seen like her chopping up this body like throwing it in like you know acid and then we're oh straight boy. to the slop that looks exactly like what was in the bucket it's just like I think that's quite clever I, I mean not, like it. groundbreaking but yeah it's <laughs> effective like you say it just creates that like nausea that's going on throughout the film as you get more and more depraved with your murders and oh, so so we find out that she has magic fingers because in order to make his tummy feel better, she pleasures our pal Frank, uh, further um, attaching her to him in this sick, psychosexual nonsense that we are mm-hmm. <laughs> knee deep in. And yeah. I just, man, this there's nothing this movie doesn't really go for. I mean, it just like yeah, goes for all the taboos, doesn't it? Yes. You were talking earlier, so I'm probably just taking us off course. Please but do. There is no ta- course. We- <laughs> we were saying like oh you know there is like i was like oh well, we're not doing like kind of films in the shallow vein but obviously there's elements here and in other in the other hell and then oh, you've got yeah. this kind of so you've got this like funeral director who's running around trying to <laughs> solve the mystery because he, <laughs> he saw him injecting the formaldehyde he just kind of peeped around the door Dude. Um, and now he's like doing his own little <laughs> sleuthing i love this private investigator slash funeral director is like it, it turns out he's like just in it for the money his whole game was to collect like a reward for the corpse. I don't, I don't understand him at all. Yeah. Well, I came across something when I was like researching this and it was, for, I think like I might not be a hundred percent right. So forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe he wasn't an actual actor. He was a local businessman who wanted to be in a film. <laughs> so I think he, I think he paid money to be in this film and that's oh. like his little go at acting. Oh, he picked a doozy. <laughs> and so I was like, well done, like to be involved in one of the most infamous Italian horrors of the time. Um, but yeah, I presume the character was written beforehand and somehow he just like got wind of it or yeah it's i don't i don't really totally, know how totally insane because yeah, i just assume he's going to the cops but the cops are you know they're not doing anything with this weirdo yeah you, you feel like he's a concerned citizen right and he's like oh you know i want to preserve like the sanctity sanct 
Sanctitude. Yeah. If you want to preserve the sanctity of like, you know, like my work as a funeral director and protecting these corpses from the crazy necrophiliac. But yeah. He's, he's you know. just another sellout. What the hell? I know. Terrible. Everyone's in it for the money. <laughs> so that's quite like, I like that dimension though to the film. It's like that added like threat of who this guy is and what's what he's up to, and then there's a nice kind of twist with it. Yeah, he's he's the best. <laughs> so you love him. we get this jogger and um what is rule number one of jogging, Rachel? Um, <laughs> I don't know what is rule number one of jogging. Don't, don't jog. It's dumb. It's bad for your knees. Okay, yeah, you tricked me with that one. Yeah, I, I got a couple more jokes. Not too <laughs> I many. I thought it was going to be something about don't use that app that everyone does when they're <laughs> oh. like showing off their running routes. <laughs> look where I am. I don't think what it's called. I know. Wow, look, we everyone, run all this way. Everyone, yeah. don't kill me. Uh, Just so don't he picks- jog. He picks up this jogger, and I don't know who this actress is, but she is just stunning. Yeah, she's very like in the the mold of uh, Frank's Anna, isn't she? She's uh, all the women are actually. They all kind of have that look. Not like I know the women we've talked about haven't previously, but yeah, his next victims all have a certain look. Uh, this is Anna Cardini, if IMDb is to be believed, and she was in a mm-hmm. few things. She was in one of those weird, freaking uh, Thomas Millian movies the uh his nico character yeah yeah <laughs> what that is a that is a whole thing like he made comedy giallo movies and i had no idea that they have a typical giallo formula you know usually minus the black glove killer but they're full on mysteries but yeah. there's going to be thomas Millie on disco dancing and it's little out- yeah strange outfits you i know, know there's so many of them oh it's that was his like once he found that character apparently that made him even more famous than he already was and that's why yeah. he kept playing that over and over again and god bless him and they're so popular because like, i have like have italian tv and like every time you switch on on a weekend it's like one of his films is on from that era it's crazy and then you <laughs> kind of forget like the person he was before because it's like you're just so used to seeing him as that character yeah he's this like groundbreaking like you know extreme like really disappearing into his roles and then he just said this is hard work <laughs> give me I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow my afro out and just do some shit <laughs> yeah and some of the scenarios in those films are pretty mad some of them are quite racist but <laughs> as you'd expect there's always horrible gay stereotypes there's always no. a racist character it's like no so every time you're watching it it's like whenever i hear like somebody say japan like i'll be doing something on my computer and i'll hear on the tv someone go oh, japanese and i'll be like oh my god what's happening because whenever i hear someone say japanese i'm like something bad's gonna happen <laughs> Something bad is happening in this film. <laughs> they don't make them like that anymore, and it's a good thing. Yeah, well, still not the most progressive in some of their films and TV. But <laughs> oh, <yeah>. brother. <laughs> I know. So the, um, after he, he brings this girl home, uh, he she's up for it. It's like he's erotically applying uh, some lotion to her sprained ankle, and she's he's like trying to get to her, and she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa finish wrapping up my ankle before we get to the good stuff Mm -hmm. and then he has to make love to her while in the room while uncovering the corpse of his love which is like dude just use your imagination yeah he has to get off with his (sighs) yeah living doll that's fine that's fine uh but she does not like this and he bites her throat out and it is pretty gruesome yeah it's quite a strange moment because, yeah, it's like those little bits of like, cannibalism almost that come in. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, f- I always forget that that's not implied. That's just cannibalism. <laughs> I know. It's like, <laughs> like, is that? Yeah. Yeah. She <laughs> was, like, she was delicious. She was clearly tasty. It reminded me of the throat ripping scene of uh, Zombie. Uh huh. Because it's just, it's just a gusher. And it's like, well, yeah. actually, actually, I think this would be like a uh, a garden hose versus the like. <laughs> The fire hose of zombie, but still very impressive. I mean, because it feels almost like unexpected, doesn't it? Because you feel like it's something you'd see like in a zombie or a cannibal film more than in something that's taking place in a wee town and well, on Wherever the border. We are. <laughs> yeah, no. So it's a black piano, we're not there. <laughs> so he throws her in the crematorium, and this is apparently the scene, the the one thing I got from the interview I read with uh, um our pal Joe D'Amato was that they thought that it was a real corpse because when the the flames kick in, the actress does this like death dance where mm-hmm. the the nerve endings are, are still reacting to the stimuli of being burned, and so she's 
folding herself up. And apparently that was a little too real for some people who thought they just threw this poor woman <laughs> into the fire. Into the burner. And this is why I'm like, how the fuck was this not a video nasty? Like, I don't need everything to be a video nasty, but like the things that ended up on the list for no reason other than their cover art versus something like this that is truly, truly upsetting. I'm not sure what the story is there, though. I'm not sure if it's because it was never released. like In England. In, in the UK. I don't know. It, yeah, okay. it's, I think, it, yeah, because you feel it, sure it would have been. I just feel like it must have not been And it, it did have released. some censorship stuff in Germany and a couple cuts in Italy. But, in Italy, yeah. yeah. So it was deemed as a bit too much, even by Italian standards <laughs> back then. Uh, so the, the cops show up. To, to question and then ever the cool cat uh, iris is like yeah come in search your boys i don't care don't get a warrant get your ass in here so they go to confidence the basement yeah she dude confidence yes uh they they go down to the basement and uh i did not know this you can bribe a police officer with a squirrel just <laughs> have a stuffed well, squirrel, a squirrel ready wasn't it? i'm just trying to think of his collection of animals i was quite impressed by the marmos i think it's a marmoset right it's wild it's like freaking uh Norman Bates is like, oh, you're fancy. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but it, that immediately stops the search. He he tries, the cop tries to go, oh, no, I don't want it. It's so nice. And she's like, here, let me wrap it for you. And she's, of course, hiding the shoe, one of the jogger's shoes, because they're, they're searching for the jogger. And, it's a bright red shoe. <laughs> and she wraps up the squirrel, and that's it. They're, we're we're out of here. Thank you, good and citizen. And they don't seem that bothered that there's this whole like taxidermy operation. I guess like it is a real job, but you think yeah. you'd be a bit more disturbed rather than being like, oh, yeah, squirrel, squirrel friend for me. I'll put on my mantelpiece. Yeah, we just don't know. That's an Italian thing that, that actually that squirrel is stuffed with lira. That's maybe, that's how maybe you that's, sneak what a bribe. that's how you do a bribe there. <laughs> oh boy. Then we have the weirdest party ever. Um, so Frank straight up tells Iris. All right, as long as I can keep my lady of the moldering corpse variety, you and I can finally get married and be together forever. So they have an announcement party, which uh, <laughs> they uh, the interviewer in, of course, I, know I tried not to reference it because we talked about how I wasn't going to go there. Spaghetti Nightmares, the Bible of the Doom Show, uh, Luca M. Palmarini and Gaetano Mastretta. Uh, they're interviewing Joe D'Amato and they ask like, so the scene at the party scene is very reminiscent of freaks. Was that intentional? And Joe DeMotto's like, hmm, I think so. I had just watched that movie right before we filmed it. And I'm like, sure, <laughs> yeah. sure. Why not? <laughs> just throw it in. Go for it. Uh, we got uh, someone polishing their dentures. Um, we've got a lady with a marvelous mustache. All of Iris's pals are way older than she is so. <laughs> now very strange maybe she just doesn't get along with the younger people like people my age think i'm a moron so my friends tend to be younger maybe that's <laughs> what i'm doing wrong i should be friends with some oldies maybe yeah i mean take that as your inspiration i mean i don't think i know anyone older than me so that's weird uh, they go to announce this wedding, and everyone's so proud and happy for her. No one realizes how truly sick and bizarre this shit is. And uh, he just bails on the party. She gets drunk, and our our pal, the, the private investigator funeral uh, man, is snooping, and he finds the body, and he does my favorite thing. He just busts out the camera and gets the most beautifully composed sh shot of the corpse on the floor ever. I'll get your evidence. It's, it's like, important. Hmm. He's an amateur photographer like, in his spare time. Right. I've really got an eye for this shit. This is nice. <laughs> and uh, it's around this time that Sis shows up. So we get two Chinzias for the price of one yep. as the, the sister who's her, her twin sister uh, shows up. I do not remember why she shows up at all. Do you have any idea what she's doing there? Is she looking for the body too? You know, now that you're saying it, I'm like, I can't remember. I, I, I swear the there was a reason, though. <laughs> Needless to say, she should not be there because um, she's either cock-blocking or just murder-blocking uh, Frank. Because he's got another girl. He's picked up the disco girl. Yeah, the one that goes who, with them really easily back to his house. Yeah, yeah, she's she's not interested in living very long <laughs> at all. But she's away. She, she gets to bail. Yeah, so... 
Lucky us. Oh, snap. <laughs> so that act, are you ready for this? That Simonetta Alodi, guess what she was in? She was in that 1980 made for TV giallo we just talked See, about from Aldo Lado. Have all these connections. And I keep saying it's made for TV. I don't actually know that, but I'm just wondering why it's No, it was made. Yeah, so. it was um, broadcast on television. So you're right. Sweet, dude. It's all coming together. <laughs> That's does. why you picked this movie. Yeah, Very there smart. you go. <laughs> <laughs> so she shows up and we have our, our big supernatural shenanigans where she hears her sister calling to her. And we have my favorite sequence in this movie Speaking of that gothic stuff you were talking about, she's wandering around the house with the power cut, with a flashlight, looking for her the spirit of her sister, not realizing that it's the corpse of her sister. And Iris disappears for a few minutes, and I'm like, is Iris doing this? Is she pretending to be her sister and calling out to her? We never establish what's going on. Yeah, I feel like the implication is it's Iris, isn't it? Because she's obviously annoyed that she's turned up and thinks it'll throw her plans into kind of chaos because frank's like yo i'm ready to trade in the old model for the new one because it's like alive yeah no more like living doll well not living not living doll (laughs) is he ready I, i don't think he's ready like you gotta at least like sedate somebody before you, if you're used to corpses you can't have a live one well he's been trying he's been you. trying but just every time at the point of orgasm he just has to kill them so he's still trying to work <laughs> that situation out hey dude relatable <laughs> i mean no it's not <laughs> there you go <laughs> letting, your, letting your little fetishes get into the podcast the police are <laughs> the police are right outside i've got a whole bunch of squirrels <laughs> <laughs> uh so yeah the whole sequence where she finds her sister's corpse is so beautiful it is oh this morbidly beautiful freaky ah oh, i got it so this atmospheric movie. yeah it's great um and then the the pi shows up again <laughs> after well after um the battle royale between uh iris and uh frank does she, she full on stabs him in the dick? Yeah, right? she stabs him in the groin. I think it's kind of like because he's like tied. Well, this is my interpretation. Like you know, like tied to your mother's apron strings. She's like the surrogate mother. Oh so then God. she stabs him in the groin. So it's the whole kind of yeah that thing going on. If if she had survived, her autobiography could have been from hand jobs to knife jobs. <laughs> why I stabbed the groinal. I don't know. I don't know what that yeah. is. But uh, he, they, they have more uh, biting. He bites her cheek open, which is nuts. Yeah, and there's the whole business Ooh. with the eye. Oh, she rips eye his eye, eye out. Yeah. Oh, geez. And then, of course, uh, he takes the knife from her and plunges it into her heart. And then we get a little body switcheroo. Um, folks, I hope you've seen this before because spoilers. You know, <laughs> but yeah, spoilers all the way through. Is, this is the big, <laughs> this is the big moment um, where our our PI guy shows up. He can't find any trace of Iris, uh, but he does find the body, the, the stolen body, in the white gown, and he wraps it in a sheet and makes a break for it. Oh, oh of course, um, Frank sees him with his one good eye and then drops dead. Of course. I mean. Pfft. If this had been successful, though, would he really have died? We would have had a sequel, boy. Anthropophagus 2 style. Like, I, I love another thing with that interview is, like, Joe D'Amato's like, oh, Anthropophagus, that didn't make any money. It's like, why, then why the fuck did you make a sequel, you liar? I mean, in fairness, Joe D'Amato <laughs> made a sequel to Copsucker 1, Copsucker 2, so I don't think Copsucker 1 did that well. Maybe wrong. Maybe it was set the um, home video pornography market alight. Dude. Um, yeah. God bless him. He, he, just like Jess Franco, he made a whole bunch of movies I'll never watch. I know. Well, this is the thing. I was actually like thinking about this. No, actually. Yeah. Yeah. No, he did do Cop Sucker 1. And two. <laughs> For when I was like, was it? <laughs> it's like, but he's got so, like, that's the thing. He's did so much in the 90s. That I feel like maybe one day I'll like try and watch it all, but maybe not. It's because it's all, you know, like Hercules, like um, a sex adventure. And I think there's a film also called 100, mm, oh 120 Days of Anal. It's another one. <laughs> Dude, if you don't tap out after 110, you, you're a strong person. <laughs> it's like maybe there's a podcast idea in there somewhere just like talking about oh, every boy. single Joe DiMasso film from the 90s. Can I can I unvolunteer for <laughs> yeah. that? Can you, I make sure you don't call me for that? <laughs> I mean, you don't want to talk about those <laughs> esteemed titles? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, he just fully really went into that whole kind of pornography thing, as many did, so... 
Dude, I mean, hey, whatever pays the bills. Like people have said, like other Italian directors have said, he's one of them. He was one of the most successful and one of the richest guys because he didn't blink. He's like, yep, that's where the money's at. See you. Yeah. Bye, horror. He worked so much as well. He did so many of those films. Like it's crazy how many he did in the in the nineties. Yeah, I think the last horror he did was that Frankenstein one. Frankenstein two thousand. Well, and it came out in nineteen ninety two, didn't it? Frankenstein two thousand. Yeah, he was, uh, and that, so far as I know, is not pornography. <laughs> well, I guess that's when the industry really like, <laughs> fell on its kind of, yeah, it just died. Oh, God, so yeah, dude, that's... had to like diversify. Oh, I think they talk about that in those um, uh, Italian Gothic horror books about like what happened, mm-hmm. like why everything fell apart, and it's it's crazy. So one of the leading uh, outputters is that even a word of cinema in the world just comes to a complete stop in the 90s. Ah, terrible. Yeah, sad. And then got such talented directors like Joe D'Amato fleeing to the, the realms of pornography. Well, Yep. And we've all fled there for other reasons. <laughs> you say, gotta go where the money is. <laughs> his, yes, his was financial. <laughs> <laughs> we get our, our big stinger ending, which I love how both of these films we're going to talk about have our big stinger Mm-hmm. It's important. <laughs> one is more effective than the other, I will say now. <laughs> Spoilers. It's this one. And uh, <laughs> she is of course is not the dead sister. They had they were about to bury the live one and uh she sits up screaming and we get the freeze frame, the end. She flies at that coffin, yeah. Boy, I love that she makes it of course, she's driven completely insane, but she lived and that made me happy it's very carrie like isn't it at the end yes and that's that's the the influence of carrie will be all over the next film we talk about but before we get to it the shocking thing about this is that this is a freaking remake yeah so yeah of mino garini's the third eye which is an excellent film which i am like waiting for a blu-ray of that to drop one of these days yeah, that would be uh, a good one to see. So yeah, Franco Nero led film um, with Erica Blanc, and yeah, it's a really if you've not seen it, it's a really good film. You should check it out. And it's a, a bit tamer, shall we say, than <laughs> what came after. But yeah, Joe Damaso was good friends with Mino, um, you know, and hence why he kind of remade the film with his own special elements. I look forward to revisiting the Third Eye because I have seen that once years and years ago. And I would just, I just want to see, like, where are the hand job sequences? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, I think that was, yeah. <laughs> a bit too f- forward for the time. Just a little. The, uh, the score for this, of course, was, it was done by them old goblins. The goblins. <laughs> Another connection to uh, the next film is they just used a bunch of music from this. So yeah, I tried to find two films that connected with one another. I think we've done quite a good job finding all the connections. You got Frank Estopi, uh, you got this, Goblins Goblin. action. And yeah, this music, man, I it is like, do you think Goblin was privileged enough to see this movie without music and were actually like writing to the sequences of this film or do you think they just were like here's here's this brown paper package in the mail and it's the tapes for the music of the movie <laughs> they had no connection to it whatsoever yeah probably that <laughs> it's, it's oh but it's so good like i i love the weird cause, you know there's the the progressive rock scene mm-hmm. people don't know dude like it was completely batshit crazy in the 70s every country has their band and a thousand other bands you've never heard of if you look for them there's a few channels on youtube that are nothing but progressive rock and the stuff coming out of italy and the uk that just aren't famous it's just it's staggering how much of that crazy music you can find of course a lot of them have crazy ass vocalists (laughs) which (laughs) Can be a little like everyone was trying to copy um, Peter Gabriel era of uh, Genesis. So like it was all this like weird, trippy, like hippie stuff. Uh, trippy hippie. Yep. I said it. Yeah. So it's a fight. But man, I oh, this this score. And if you like it, <laughs> we're going to hear it again. <laughs> yeah, I like I, I really like that kind of like progressive rock and horror films. I think it works really well. Yeah, and anytime a modern film goes there now, like 
like Beyond the Black Rainbow or mm-hmm. to a much more Pink Floyd extent, uh, Doctor Strange. Uh, they did some very nice uh, old style prog rock and I was like, yeah, yeah, because it's quite unusual to hear it now. But yeah, back then it was like everywhere. I guess because I think of it as like my parents' generation, like that was like you know the music that my dad was listening to and stuff. So I guess you know, like you were saying, it's so it was just everywhere, wasn't it? So yeah, it it drove people nuts, <laughs> especially film uh, music critics were like, no more progressive <laughs> rock. That's why punk rock just put an end to that shit. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, we can get out of here in two and a half minutes. Thank God. I know, because it's one of those things when you see, like, younger generations, sometimes they're a bit funny about, like, I think most people do love Goblin, but sometimes people are a bit, like, maybe not just Goblin, but, you know, like, progressive rock in that year of horror films are like, oh, I don't like the soundtrack, it's too, like, it's too ridiculous. So, like, I'm thinking of, like, Inferno, you get a lot of, like, criticism about Inferno soundtrack. Dude, I'll tell you what, I recently, <laughs> I always, I have a music room with all my guitars and all my crap in it, and I always trash it whenever I'm doing a music project, and I, I grab a record... And I throw a record on and I listen to a record while I'm cleaning. And I picked very poorly one night. I picked the Inferno soundtrack and it wasn't scary so much as wildly unnerving in the, the quiet side of the house at night. It just made me really upset. Really? That's interesting. And I was like, this music is so effective. It's such an effectively freaking bonkers score. I mean, good Lord. I know it's like that bit in the taxi when you see Eleanor and Georgie's like Sarah, like in the taxi and that music's playing. Like, I can see why people might be like, oh, it's ridiculous. But it's also like you say, like, really, it's just jarring because it's like sounds that you're not used to hearing and like sounds in that context that you're not used to hearing. And and there's something really like clever about it. That's what's so refreshing about modern films with a cool score like i'm i'm a totally shameless synthesizer music score lover i'm just it's just ridiculous yeah i love sense it's just all that 80s shit packed into my brain i can't i'll (laughs) never get over it but even just music that's different and like not sounding like your traditional strings and the beats you know I, i love just like weird stuff there's a little movie that came out recently called the stylist yeah yeah and the score is just fantastic. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and I really like the score to St. Maud. I thought that was great. Ooh, I still haven't got to that. I'm so bad. All right, okay. You should check that out because that's got a good score. It's I got will. some good bands on it as well, like Gang of Four, I think, or in a tiny bit. Um, oh. Yeah, so it's very cool. Um, yeah, check, definitely check that out. I love Gang of Four, dude. So yeah, I'm all about that. That's yeah. amazing. Um, but yeah, thank you for picking Beyond the Darkness. It is... It is like a singular film in this era. Like, I mean, obviously, I love Entropophagus. I love uh, Rosso Sangue. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, Death Smiled at Murder. That's in, like, my top ten favorite films of all time. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. Joe D'Amato was on a tear in this era, and I think he just didn't want to be the horror guy. Or or he just, like we talked about, he just didn't see the money in it he, he saw the tide turning away from this mm-hmm. trend before anybody else did yeah it's like uh, i guess you get different type of filmmakers don't you and i think joe damato is more of like a journeyman director he would just kind of go to what he thought would make money and would be popular or where he could push the boundaries so we're grateful for him because for t- i think with beyond the darkness his objective was to disgust people to shock people which he did and is still managing to do so I don't know if that's the same with Copsucker. <laughs> <laughs> if this doesn't end up on like your like your top fifty most extreme films list, you know, then you haven't seen it because this this stays unsettling even after all these years. Yeah, and I think there's that weird romanticism to the film, like the way it starts off with maybe you'd expect a film like this to start off with something really gruesome, but it's that way you know, like he's there in the hospital and she's like, you know, make love to me before I die, and there's this like element of melancholy. And then you feel like everything he does is partially motivated by this love for his dead girlfriend and how he kind of wants to preserve her slightly. Because at the start, she's like, you know, make, she says to someone like, make me look healthier. And then he's like, you know, not him, but Iris is doing her nails. And yeah, it's like kind of pr- trying to preserve his love. So and she has this kind of love for him. Like Iris has this love for him. So it's a bit like a morbid love triangle. So even though it's like extreme and crazy and ridiculous, like there is that element there as well, which, yeah, is quite an interesting component well you make you made Did valentine's make, yeah. day very <laughs> special you're a very romantic person <laughs> i know i'm trying i'm trying we need to talk about the sequel to this film called the other hell which is not a sequel 
a sequel in our podcast. It's a sequel to our our discussion. It's a sequel in in music scoring. And Frank is One of the most infamous dudes, uh, freaking Bruno Matai, uh, teaming up with his boy, uh, Claudio Fragasso, of Troll 2 fame. And, uh, and you know, this is... I, I don't really like the trailer for this one. It's more of a... Just clips of the movie, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that okay. for your ears' sake. But um, I do have the VHS here of the other hell again in my virtual collection in my Google either. And dudes, like this is so good. This company that put out this VHS tape is called Lettuce, like the green leafy lettuce. But it's Lettuce Entertain You Incorporated. <laughs> That's grim. <laughs> <laughs> my my dad my dad who was like the most like the driest lame dad jokes just sat up out of his grave and was like no nah, nah, no dude like- cut that that's that's terrible <laughs> even that one's too far here's the plot from the back of the tape a series of brutal murders and mutilations in a dark forbidding convent has the sisters terrified as one person after another is horribly murdered not even the investigators sent by the church are safe from this horrible fate the story takes a bizarre twist as the dead start returning to life and the sisters know that they are in quote unquote the other hell this gripping tale of suspense and horror will keep you on the edge of your seat and out of the dark we suggest you watch this movie with a friend you trust or none it doesn't say or none. I added that part. It's not, I was going to say, was that, yeah, you've ruined it for me. <laughs> I'm creative. <laughs> but dude, this is 1981 and oh, brother. <laughs> this is a first time watch. So folks, got to give a shout out to my pal Tyler, friend of the show. He actually just randomly sent me this in a big pile of movies one day. He's like, hey, I have too many movies. You want some stuff? And I said, of course. And the other hell was in the pile. And he's like, have you seen that? I'm like, Nope. He's like, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> oh boy. And I didn't need the, I didn't need good luck. Well, I needed good luck for a couple of sequences in this to get me through, but um, we are back with our goblins with the same music. Yep. Although they're doing some interesting stuff. They've taken, I want to say it's not all like the score from Beyond the Darkness. It's also from their record called Roller. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're playing some of it at the same time. So you have this pretty funky music. Um, I almost said play that funky music, white boy, but I didn't say it. Um, but they're actually like playing some of the more funky stuff on top of the creepier shit. So you've got this melange of like weird music coming at you. Yeah. This it's an interesting choice, but yeah, it's cool. It's different. Ooh, it's, it's very different. I love it. So we like, we like different, as we said. The English dub for this is magnificent. Like the English dub for Beyond the Darkness, very serious, very serviceable. Uh, this is <laughs> this is out there. I love when the voice actors are. I just can't imagine they aren't having fun with this stuff. Yeah, it's just oh, it's beautiful. the The beginning is one of the most disjointed, confusing beginnings ever. Uh, there is a nun. A flashlight. So we got the flashlight connection. Um, she's got a bunch of skulls, though. We are in these catacombs in Italy, which apparently are from the plague days. So these are real human skulls. And then we have the red flashing light that's supposed to be Satan. The flashing eyes. Yeah, it's very, um, kind of like reminded me of the black cat. Luigi Cotsu's a black cat with eyes. It does. It, what it reminds me of is someone had this thing in their house that they thought looked weird. And so they filmed it and they shouldn't have because it looks really terrible. Because <laughs> like, you can sort of see a face. I mean, you could definitely see the glowing eyes, but then it's just got this circle of glass around it. Yeah. It was an interesting choice. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite Bruno Mattei film, though, so... Oh, hey. Hey, I am not... I'm not knocking the film. I'm just very confused. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, that's what's good. Like, from the very beginning, you know, there's like a lot that's chucked at you. So, yeah. <laughs> Just kind of have to go with it. <laughs> She's creeping around, looking for her pal, calling out to her with the uh, the flashlight. She's looking around, looking around. She ends up in the basement of this church, and uh, we have a, a naked, uh, semi-nude nun, a corpse, and a lot of uh, mad sciencey gear 
all over the room and bubbling cauldron and creepy green fluids running through uh, uh, beakers and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, I got to say, of all the death metal bands that I saw back in the 90s, none in Balmer were pretty good. And uh, they opened for um, Half Burned Babyface. Lovely name. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. That's my jokes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we get this nun who is totally crazy, and it looks a lot like, uh, is this Frank Astapi, or is this a different? This is a different. Are you talking about sister is like a Azun- Zunta? Yeah. Yes. That's is that? Place. Okay. This is, I'm so confused. I know, because it's very dark in fairness, so there's lots of nuns about, and there's this other nun, and then there's like a mummified nun. Oh my god. She, she's embalming this nun. She's ripping guts out from from the lady parts area. It's kind of like an abortion almost, there's something they say, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think that baby is going to make it. Yeah, basically they're just hacking away at our reproductive organs because they're Ooh. the kind of uh, portal or like entryway into hell. Wow. Yeah, all evil <laughs> comes from a woman's reproductive system. I can't remember exactly the quote, but it's basically, yeah, something along those lines. When everyone knows it's really the gallbladder <laughs> from uh, Flesh for Frankenstein. Hey. <laughs> She says, the devil is in heaven. And I said, hey, that's news to me. I did not know about this development. <laughs> it explain a lot. But this is a cinemac production. So the, the, the opening credits have started. We've got this, like, hilarious jump scares, which we're telegraphing. There's, I'm sorry, folks. There's so much going on. I'm trying to hold it together. There's, like, two or three jump scares that will predict the end of the movie, thus making the end of the movie not <laughs> effective. <laughs> it wasn't really necessary, that's for sure. Uh, but so we get we get some credits and we find out the name of the director is by Stephen Oblosky. Yes, yeah, Stefan Oblos- Oblosky. Well, I forgot how prolific he was in the early 80s. Yeah, he's everywhere. <laughs> uh, but this is a Cinemec uh, production. If, if Joe D'Amato had been involved, maybe this could have been a, uh, a film mirage. I always love to see Phil Mirage come up. Dude, that's the best. Like like Jeffrey says in the show, it's like a film, but it's a mirage. <laughs> uh, this company, uh, Cinemac, made the true story of the Nun of Monza. Interesting. We've heard of that. And something called Rebels of Arizona, a Western from 1970. So not a very prolific company. The true story of Monza was um, made simultaneously with Other Hell, which kind of explains that. So they were shooting yeah, kind of simultaneously. Man, and that's one thing. The locations for this, this like crumbling building slash monastery is awesome. It's so, it's a character in and of itself. Yeah, it's really it. cool. Shenanigans are happening in this freaking uh, nunnery where you've got obviously a, cr- a crazy nun is, is butchering people in the basement, but also... Um, there's supposedly possession, so you've got possessed nuns. And I'm gonna say, I was shocked we had no sexy nuns. Yeah, because if I don't know if you've seen it, have you seen the true story of the nun of Monza? I have not. I have not seen it. That's that. very much in that vein. It's lots of sex, lots of that kind of goings on, lots of like kind of oh, sapphic, okay. sapphic encounters. Um, but yeah, here it's totally different. It's very much more like on the horror kind of side of things where you don't really see because you'd expect like from nun exploitation to be very much like kind of lots of lesbian encounters and nudity and nuns with their like half of their habits on and their breasts exposed and whatever but none of that here we're just more going for the whole kind of exorcist devil possession side of things bruno matai was like this isn't your mom's nun exploitation this is 1981 y'all well the whole thing was like it was influenced by inferno right which is pretty clear to see so Oh, yeah, yeah, it's very much more in the Inferno style of things than non-exploitation, despite being in a convent. And the aforementioned Carrie, but we'll get to her later. Yeah, yeah, of course. There's going to be a lot of list. I have a lot of list making I did while watching this, just reacting to this <laughs> film for the first time. So here comes some of my list. I got a slow-mo owl and stock footage. That's uh, production value. I love <laughs> it. Um, we've got mannequins. We've got a whole room. Uh, we've got we don't got creepy dolls later, but for now we've got a whole room where mannequins are hanging from the ceiling. Yep. There's a mysterious girl who is prepared for the pandemic. She's got her mask on. She does. And we've got a sleepy kitty. And I was like, guys, you're showing me a cat. You're showing me this cat over and over again. Don't mess around. Don't be getting creepy with that cat. And of course they do. But we got fake bats. 
And, um, oh, we even have, um, what's that thing called where, um, people bleed? Uh, stigmata. No, it's like they bleed from their palms and they bleed from their ankles. I think it's, it's like, like Jesus. Yeah, it's supposed to be stigmata. No, it's called acupuncture. How do you not know that, All dude? Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that felt good. Thank you. So, yes, it's called stigmata. But I love these jump scares. Oh, they're so cute. Rah! They jump out of their coffins. Rah! We've got a, a creepy groundskeeper who looks really familiar to me. Who is that guy? Did he? Oh, it's Boris, and he's mm-hmm. played by uh, Franco Garofolo. No relation to the comedian Janine Garofolo. Never heard of him. <laughs> but this dude, of course, he was in Hell of the Living Dead, mm-hmm. Cult 38 Special Squad. Oh, my God. Dude. Sex of the Witch, which I am really looking forward to reevaluating. I used to regard Sex of the Witch as like the worst Giallo ever. It's pretty, and now, yeah. <laughs> and now that I know it's it's probably not the worst, but I'm looking forward to that Blu-ray. Yeah, the Vinegar Syndrome release of them. It's going to be wild. <laughs> I mean, we have got, we've got to thank Vinegar Syndrome for giving us stuff like that that we would have never thought we would see on Blu-ray. Hey, they helped me clean out some stuff because those box sets were coming out fast and furious. And I was like, I got to get rid of some shit. So I started getting rid of all my budget movie compilations, like 50 movies. Yeah. <laughs> 50 terrifying horror classics. And I said, you guys got to make room for like three Giallo movies, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, I didn't pick up the most recent one with the sister Versala. I was like, you know, what? I'm going to tap out. Did you do something in what that set? Did you? Are yeah, you? Yeah, I did. The killer is still um, among us. Oh, see, that's the one I want out of those three, though. I know. Well, <sighs> maybe in a sale one day you'll pick up. Uh, dude, I'm telling you that. And um, I was avoiding that and the other. I think it's just called the Monster of Florence. Yeah. Yeah, there's the two like infamous. Yeah, the Monster of Florence films. Yeah, they made them while the crimes were still actively happening. Yeah, you know Italians. And they're both really good. I really like both of those movies. Yeah, I think they're really good. I, I think The Killer yeah. Still Among Us gets a bit of an unfair reputation. I think it's a good... I like it. I think it's good. It's got some comedy in it, too. It's got, like, the funny stuff in it. I was like, was not expecting any, like, humor. Yeah, it's good. It's a- hey. Hey. Anyway, folks, sorry. buy me a copy. Buy me a copy. Help me help Rachel. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So our pal uh, Boris keeps a bunch of doggies, and we have the least scary dog ever. So we get to meet our buddy, Father Valerio. He's been sent in to investigate all this insanity going on. And this is Carlo DeMejo. Love him. Um, I Weirdly enough, I haven't watched a film with him in a while, and my brain was like, oh, it's Hugo Stiglitz. <laughs> and I'm like, how, <laughs> how, because because they both have beards. Like, how did I mix like up? Yeah. <laughs> That's really strange. So yes, I won't talk about that on a podcast for people to hear. But uh, this is my boy from House by the Cemetery, uh, Manhattan Baby, another uh, women's prison massacre alumnus. <laughs> Love that they're all tied together through that common strand. <laughs> Yay! And of course, he was in my favorite Giallo of all time: The Dead Are Alive. Woo. Is that your favorite? Yeah, dude. I never heard anyone say that. That's our favorite. Was, I'm not like I'm not criticizing your opinion. I've just never heard anyone say that. So it's like, oh, it's an outsider choice. I know a lot of yeah, people I like who that, can't though. I like that. stand that movie. No, for many, 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 many years, it was um, Seven Bloodstained Orchids was my favorite Giallo of all time. Mm. And then I watched it thirty bajillion times, and I just need I needed to take it off of its uh, pedestal for a little while. And uh, dude, dead or alive, it, it's. I think they made it for me specifically. It's just, <laughs> just for you. <gasps> but yeah, oh, beautiful. But yes, he, our pal Carlo De Mejo is here to investigate, get some shit solved. Well, so he thinks, and he gets um run down by the cutest dog ever. <laughs> This slobbery like fat thing. <laughs> yes, yes. This slobbery chunky boy who's, I guess, some kind of a pit bull or something, just charges him, s- almost smiling, coming after him. And then when we get to Boris rescuing him, the dog is just laying on top. I know. Of Carlo <laughs> But it's weird because you see other dogs like in the dog pen or the yep. cages or whatever, and they're like the proper kind of like Doberman, like fierce yeah, dogs. German and then they choose that one. Yeah, just German Shepherds, even. Yeah. And then you've just got like him being chased by that fat wee thing. Maybe Carlo DeMejo's like, please don't send an actual attack dog after me. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe it's like stipulated in his contract. Um, he has a little talk with uh, with um, with Boris about what's going on, and of course, Boris is like, "I relate to animals more than people, but I'm still gonna cut this chicken's head off." <laughs> Good old animal violence in an Italian horror. <laughs> and and hopefully, that's the only real animal violence in this because there's a staged one. I'm praying it's staged because it made me very upset. <laughs> But yes, I know where chicken comes from. I'm one of those hypocritical animal lovers who still <laughs> consumes meat. So I know where bacon comes from. It comes from chickens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a nun. We have a nun bonfire, which, hey, this is basically a giallo because every giallo has a hooker bonfire where the prostitutes are standing around a bonfire keeping warm. But this time we've got nuns burning stuff. Yep, get the evil out. Yeah, boy, and, and th- I guess it was like their old IKEA furniture that was possessed. Because uh, what are they even burning? <laughs> I don't understand. Like, yeah, burning all the like furniture in the convent. <laughs> <laughs> they want to redecorate. I thought we just had attack nuns, but we get full on zombie nuns. Yeah, you know, go for everything. While all this is going on, there's a blob nun. There's a nun with no face. Yeah, with holding the cat, right? Yeah, she's carrying the kitty around, and I feel bad for this actress. I don't know if she could see with that thing on her face, so she's maybe she memorized how many steps it was to get to the doors. <laughs> I love the I love the imagery with that though, because again, like you said, it's like influenced by Inferno, and that's obviously like a nod to Anya Peroni and her um, cat. Oh man, that whole thing of like yeah, cats being evil and stuff, and that's like her familiar, and the cat appears whenever you know she's going to strike with her powers so yeah i I really love that that's one of my favorite images in the film just when she watches the cat it's great just having that you know her face covered yeah and and that opaque uh window on the door that she's like kind of like obscured behind it's so good she's she's the third point five mother of tears yeah maybe that's she would have been better than yeah mother of tears from the mother of tears film i know the silicone boob job mom yeah as we all know her as bless her heart (laughs) So even though the film has some questionable elements, there, it does have some really cool imagery in it. Oh, dude. And that's the thing. You picked a secret giallo because, you know, we've got a, a series of murders. So like a priest is set on fire and people are getting stabbed and you've got the freaking mannequins. You've got creepy dolls and you've got our, our detective, Mr. Uh, uh, Father Valerio, Carlo de Mejo Valerio. He is like doing this weird thing where he's recording his thoughts but he also yeah. has a film camera going. Which is really cool. Yeah, it's almost like he's, like, I don't know if, if it made in a different, different time, if it'd be almost like a pseudo kind of documentary type thing. Ooh, but yeah. yeah, basically everything's being recorded. And you don't tend to see that in a film of this period, I would Mm-mm. say. Maybe I'm wrong. But yeah, and then that comes to the fore later on. Um, yeah. So there's this idea throughout the film about science versus, you know, like religion and the otherworldly. And he's very much a man of science and he has all his tech and he wants to explain things in a rational way. So I guess coming back to the shallow mystery element, you're always wondering about how much of it, like, are the murders supernatural in nature or are they just, you know, the work of someone who's, you know, just like a standard killer? So it's quite cool that you have that, like, fight between science and religion and always wondering, yeah. You try to get away from those old yellow films. They just keep pulling you back in. Yeah. See, I think that's why this is my favorite, like, Bruno Mattei film. Because I know he's done, like, he did, like, Madness and stuff. But, like, yeah, this feels very much, oh like, in the vein of the gel. Oh, Madness, dude. <laughs> oh, my God, that movie. <laughs> Woo! That, that, folks, check out Madness by Bruno Mattei. You, you, you have not seen anything quite like that one. Yeah, I don't think like many people have seen Madness personally. It's like one of those ones that, yeah, it's a really odd, like kind of nineties version of an Argento shot. Well, it's basically Tenebrae, isn't it? That'll be uh, Forgotten <laughs> Gialli Volume Sixty Two or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it. I promise. We're Vinegar Syndrome. Hi. <laughs> they don't. I don't speak for them. Um, <laughs> but dude, this like uh, we find out what happened. So what happened was is our pal Mother Superior, um, Mother Vincenza Franca Stoppi, She had a child. And um, who the father was was maybe Satan or not if Boris or Satan. <laughs> yes, or the bo- or, or both. Boris. Yeah. yeah, we both went there. She <laughs> she was trying to protect her baby from back when she was um, junior nun from the mother superior at the time, who was like, "We got to deal with this kid. We got to put him up for adoption. Make sure he goes to a good home." No, no. This lady full on tries to shove this child into a boiling cauldron of water. 
and burns its face because, you know, um, you can't slip stuff by Franca Stoppy. She's going to stoppy you from doing that. Well made, her, made her name a pun. That's good. <laughs> and so this poor child has grown up with a, you know, burns all over her face. And of course, she's a special child because she has telekinetic abilities. Yeah. I mean, why not? Dude. Supernatural film. Why not? So this is what has been happening. We've got this girl living in the bowels of this, uh, this nun palace. And, uh, she's been, um, has she been killing people or is it just our pal nun who's been our, our mother superior has been doing it? Do we ever find out? Well, I think also, you know, the whole idea of like the cat appears and then something happens. And then it's always like, you know, like with the priest when he gets caught in the flames, it's like no one else seems to be around. Ooh. And that's, it seems supernaturally motivated, but yeah, it's a bit like you wonder because it's always that, as I said, like, is it a human killer? Is it supernatural? Is it a combination of both? You know, is the daughter just innocent or is she really the daughter of the devil? All these questions. All I know is they kill the cat and it looks poorly staged, which means it probably didn't happen. But the cat, Boris, six his doggies on the cat and the dogs are certainly good actors. It look like they're killing something, but you can't see it. And I'm just like, he holds up what looks like a cat corpse, but it looks homemade. Yeah, I mean, we've seen cat corpses quite a few times in Shelly, so... You know, <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. I feel like maybe that's one step too far. Like, maybe they'll ha- happily kill a chicken, yeah. maybe not a cat. And then also because Frank and Stoppy love cats so much, I'm going to just pretend that she wouldn't have allowed that. See, and I'm a horrible hypocrite because I'm like, I'll watch Can- Cannibal Man. And at the beginning of Cannibal Man, there's all this uh, uh, slaughterhouse footage. I'm like, well, that's where my cheeseburgers come from. <laughs> But if you hurt an animal that's like a pet, I got a problem. So yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm an asshole. But dude, come on. I mean, you've seen my my crunked up weird cat running around here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How could you want to hurt such a thing, <laughs> evil Boris? Oh my god, <laughs> Boris. He gets his. Uh, the dogs attack him, rip his throat out. Fairy likes Asperia. So oh, another man. Argento kind of connection. Oh brother, I love it. I love the 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 fake out where you think it's going to be okay, and then oh, there's a dog in the room with me. Ah, <laughs> so cute. Um, so we have a showdown between um our our little uh daughter Carrie and uh, her mom, and uh, she tries to stab her, and we get the most beautiful sequence. We have the creepy catacombs and the the weird tunnels under the place with like that weird lighting and everything's very mysterious. And she's just walking through this just beautiful freaking decrepitude of this building. And I'm like, man, this is what Italian horror is to me. Oh, and of course, uh, mean old Frank Estapi has to stab um, Carlo De Mejo. Doesn't stab him in the dick this time, but she does stab him repeatedly in the leg. It's actually it's actually quite gruesome the way she stabs. You see the knife just going in and out of this horrible wound. Yeah, and like beyond the darkness, she's kind of like demented with it. Yeah. So another like gray image of her face just like covered in blood and the wild eyes. So <laughs> yeah. And that is one of the descriptors of this film. <laughs> when we get to our little wrap up, I'll talk about it. <laughs> uh but so she she gets gotten by her own child, and it's just Carlo de Mejo screaming, and they hold the camera on him too long is one of the funniest things. I have ever seen. Bless this movie for bringing it. It is so like, because the the daughter bursts in and the light glows and everything. And he's just like, no, it's like, hold it, hold it. Keep going. Keep going. It's so beautiful. Yeah. It's really like, it's a, like you say, like a beat, like longer than you're expecting. And it's (laughs) quite weird. (laughs) So cute. Uh, It all ends in tragedy. Supposedly he didn't die. He went totally insane. And of course, uh, mother and her psychic Carrie daughter both die, and then we have <laughs> the another Monsignor father Pope. I don't know some guy uh, down in the down in the catacombs talking about the events that led to this insanity with another nun, and you know that someone's going to jump out of one of them coffins. We've had zombie nuns, we've had zombie groundskeepers. We're going to have another pop out of the coffin, and it's already spoiled because they did it so badly earlier. <laughs> And then turn up, and we get the nun. It, 
barely lit this scene to begin with. <laughs> so she pops out and you can barely see her and it's the end. Oh my god. It's another, yeah, like ending where he's just like, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> oh boy. Just that. So, you know, we got to talk about some of this cast before we get to our... I'm sure if there's anything I skipped from that plot by blasting through it, please feel free to uh, bring them up. Um, I believe we got Tom Falahi. I believe... Is it Tom Falahi or Tom Falahi? Do you have any idea? Falahi, isn't it? I believe... It's Irish? Falahi. Falahi. Born in Budapest. Uh, this is 230 credits. If you made a movie without him, you didn't make a movie. He's in a lot of films. Oh, I do like how his last credit was from Fulci's Voices from Beyond as restaurant. What does it say? <laughs> restaurant manager. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I hate when it's like something like that. You want it to be something cool and it's like restaurant manager. <laughs> I, he may have been. It's been a while since I've seen that. He could have been a pivotal character in there. We talked about our pal uh, Franco Garofolo. Uh Paola Montero is one of the sisters, the, the, our crazy sister. Mm -hmm. She was in uh, freaking Twitch of the Death Nerve, a.k.a. Bay of Blood. My uh, second favorite Mario Baba film. Oh, my God. There you go. <laughs> also, we got uh, as Father Inardo, the guy who sends Carlo DeMejo to go investigate this shit. This is Andre Aureli, who was in everything. He was just in everything. 164 credits. Oh, my Lord. I love these prolific guys. I love to work. So busy, yeah. You wonder if he's one of those card-carrying, like, Italian Actors Guild people who's like, uh, you get that funding if you cast them. Yeah, I know. More than likely. Uh, so what did I miss? Like, I, I obviously <laughs> went really fast through that movie. Any uh, any points of interest you wanted to talk about? Just trying to think what <laughs> which bits to pick up on. Just, like, again, back to the Infernal Connection. I think it's... Obviously, like Bruno Mattei was influenced by it, where he said he had, he said he was. I know there's some discrepancies about, you know, shooting schedules and how much of Inferno he saw. Like some people say it was like just a tiny, you know, like he got wind of the production while it was being produced. But anyway, by the by, but yeah, I just love all those like um like the nods to alchemy and mysticism and like I said before about the science and that's like really cool because even though like the film is ridiculous in many ways, that there's this like attempt to try and like bring this idea into the film and it's like rosemary's baby like isn't it it's like spawning the devil and women spawning satan and the evilness of their reproductive organs and whatever um <laughs> just always like always fun yeah i i pick on it but yeah no i fully i really enjoyed this viewing and i really do think that he was trying to make a point because you've got this outsider who's like uh mr carlo de Mejo. like he says things that would have gotten him excommunicated yeah, exactly. Like, you know, he's very much about science and progress, pro being like progressive in the church and how we need to start believing that it's like people's psychology that's Satan, not Satan himself, which yeah. seems yeah, a very radical idea in the Catholic Church. He literally says the only devil is in the mind. And yeah. I'm like, how does how do they not just rip his freaking collar off? Like, you're out of here, brother. <laughs> you're done. <laughs> but then that thing is, at the end, he's just turned into this babbling, raving person going on about demonic possessions. So, in the end, the demons win over science. <laughs> they better. And then there's that weird bit, like, just going back to, you know, like, when we find out about uh, Mother Vincenza and the baby, he's, like, we've talked before about the technology, but, yeah, he kind of uses the technology to see that. Right. It's almost like a weird interference where like, you see the kind of waves and then he sees it as it played out X number of years ago. I love that. I think it's really weird. Well, I like, like moments like that. You know what they could have done? And maybe they this was like the idea to begin with was, so you have him filming a bunch of stuff and they would develop his footage later and find that psychic transmission of the events from the past. Like, yeah, th those things were captured like through the psychic child who you know use she puts the whammy on the <laughs> on the mother superior to kill her like you wonder if like that like she had the power to manifest things on video just like freaking samara in the ring oh my god oh my god oh my god, oh my god. Oh my god. what did you say in the psychic oh it was like a was like a transmission yeah psychic transmission i love that like just this idea that's in the film of psychic transmissions like we could have got developed a bit further. But yeah, I like that. I think it's a when, nice touch. When you do the commentary, you can take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's ever going to happen. <laughs> I think it's already had like a like, seven have released it. Maybe someone in the... Oh, I don't know about the UK. 
Is it in the UK? I'm still rocking the ancient freaking um, uh, Shriek Show DVDs for these things. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. It looks good on Blu-ray, though. Like that bit when um, Father like walks up you know, to the doors yeah. and you've got the emblems on the doors and it's all, like blue from the Ooh. thunderstorm behind and all the reds. And That's, again, why it's kind of similar to Inferno, though, isn't it? It's the lighting scheme is quite similar. And then I'm trying to think, if I made, did I make notes or something? I was like, just the, uh, if there's anything else. Oh, yeah, it's the same typography at the start. And the poster is the same. The poster is similar to Inferno's one. So there's a lot of Inferno connections there. Well, let's see. Oh, hey. Well, I know this cinematographer from other things. I don't know him personally. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> Giuseppe uh, Bernardini. Yeah. I want to say we just talked about him on an upcoming episode. Intriguing. Well, he shot Fatal Frames as everyone's goal in, oh, in life was. <laughs> yeah. You know how, well. Oh, he shot Stigma, aka Stigma. That's what uh, Brad and I are going to talk about pretty soon is uh, oh, cool. good old Jose Ramon Larraz. Yeah. Just cool, yeah, it's good. And of course, like every great filmmaker, he shot Dog Lay Afternoon. A Dog Lay Afternoon is another Frank Astapi film. Oh, George Eastman co directing. What? And Frank Astapi, like you said, oh my God, this is crazy. Yeah, so all these connections always connect back. Dog Lay Afternoon is something you probably have to have a strong stomach for. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the title's intriguing. Yeah, well, it's pretty, you know. What you see is what you get with that title. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Hey, folks, I'm still more necrophilmy than uh, Best animal husbandry. <laughs> <laughs> but, dude, so this movie is, it's obviously sacrilegious, and it's got the wide-eyed craziness. That was what I was going to talk about, was just everyone is cranked up to 11 on this bad boy. This movie is grotesque. Like it's really perfectly paired with beyond the darkness with the, it's like focus on not focus. It's a reliance on blood and gore in certain sequences. And of course that opening embalming scene with is just messed up (laughs) to say the least. It does start out quite strongly. (laughs) And it's uh, I mean, I get the vibe from this. I'm always looking for, that Italian horror, European horror vibe. But like, I just, I just love that unique way that they approached horror, especially in Italy. It was always so interesting to look at, even when they had very little money to do anything. Yeah. And you get something like this, which I know like Bruno, like I went to, on Twitter yesterday and I was like, Oh, what's everyone's favorite Bruno Mattei film? Cause I felt like there's not really like a consensus on it. And then like people are always like, Oh, Bruno Mattei is a shit director, blah, blah, blah. His films are trash. But then you pick up something like the other hell. And it's like you say, like visually, I think it's an impressive film. Like there's some really cool bits. Like it's like nothing you've really seen before. Like that's what Italian horror is like though, isn't it? It's just very much like things you wouldn't expect to see in horror or just a certain distinct visual style. And the other hell definitely has that. What else has he done? I mean, I love Shocking Dark. It's uh, it's a little, it's a little long in the tooth, mm-hmm. but it it is so fun. Just like its reliance on uh, you know, aliens. <laughs> well, that's the thing. His films <laughs> and Terminator. His films are always really fun. Like even if they're not like the best films ever, it's like you have fun with them, which is kind of what you want. Um, I am a fan of Madness. That movie is completely yep. insane. Of course, I love Zombie Three and whatever. He and uh, Fergrasso contributed to that along with Fulci is just great. I started watching Rats Night of Terror, but they kept setting the rats on fire and I had to bail. (laughs) Killing animals is bad in films, but making them suffer? That ain't right, y'all. And of course, our boy, uh, Paul Nashi, in uh, one of my favorites is The Hunchback of the Morgue. Yeah, it's a good one. He full on sets rats on fire and in interviews, he's like, Fuck those rats. I hated those rats. They tried to kill me. Like <laughs> justification. <laughs> I love him. He's so friggin' nuts. But yeah, I think um God, I honestly think if you if you don't count uh Zombie 3, I I think uh the other hell might be my favorite of his stuff I've seen. Yeah, it's certainly up there. I would say it's one of his better ones. I don't know. I guess it's all your personal preference, but I think it's definitely one of it's definitely my favorite. I do love madness and shock and dark and rats and stuff, but just because I love rats being set on fire. <laughs> hey, that's your thing, man. I understand. Buddy, uh, Claudio Fergasso, I mean, he's another one that's like just an unstoppable force of crazy shit that he wrote and directed. 
the true story of the Nana Monza and other hells, as I said, were made simultaneously and Claudio Fragasso was involved in both. I think he said himself that he was more involved with the other hell than Mate ah. gives him credit for. But that's you always get these disputes about films that's so hard to kind of pin down. You know, they're always like, no, I did this, I did that. And see, that's a rare, that, that's a missed opportunity. Spaghetti Nightmares has no interview with Bruno Matai. So sad. I would really make that book just have some. Fragrasso did Monster Dog, which I'm a huge Monster Dog fan. Oh yeah, Monster Dog's great, yeah. The animal thing they did in that one was they didn't feed the dogs for a few days, and then they stuffed um, uh, like meat and dog food in the dude's pockets. So the, the dogs attacked him, and they're like, dude, they're gonna kill him. Which is so evil, <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of movies that maybe overstay their welcome a little bit, uh, Beyond Darkness from 1990, not to be confused with Beyond the Darkness. I'm really looking forward to seeing that again. Yeah, I'm 88 put out in the UK on Blu-ray. Yeah, they did. So that was an unexpected one. Didn't it? You know, that's the thing. It's like, I don't know what I expect to see from, from Claudio Fragasso, but that wasn't, yeah, one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, wow, so I'm just trying to think. He did... Um, Zombie Four after dark after death, which is I almost said after darkness. Uh, freaking Zombie Four is incredible. Yeah. Um, and Palermo to is it Palermo to Milan? Oh, I don't know that one. Pa- Palermo to Milan, one way. I've never heard of. Yeah, that. that's actually seen as pretty decent. Like it's it's pretty good. It's all you'd expect anyway. Oh, Giannini's in it. Oh my god. Yeah, it's got a good cast. It's got a guy in it named Ricky Memphis. Yeah, that's his real name. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a, there was a sequel to that as well. Um, I can't remember what year it was now, but yeah, it was pretty popular. But I don't know how well known it is outside of Italy. Cool. Yeah, you have to tackle Claudio Fragasso at some point, dude. Well, you know, Night Killer. Where... I, I've never seen Night Killer. I have it. Oh, there you go. Well, <laughs> you're in for a treat. Well, you know, I'm familiar with the Bollywood ripoff of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Now I got to see the Italian ripoff of Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, and there's a Nightmare on Elm Street. Is that Hungarian? There's a kind of, well, it's not like a ripoff necessarily, but it's kind of like a an ode to Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy pitches up in it, anyway. Oh, boy. <laughs> I think it's Hulga- Hungarian. It's Eastern European. Man, they make the best Nightmare on Elm Street movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, thank you for picking these movies. This was a crazy time. No problem. It's been fun talking about them <laughs> and all their craziness. So, yeah, it's good to talk about some pretty out there films even by italian horror standards folks can find you at hypnotic crescendos uh the blog and uh fragments of fear the podcast what are some other things you want to talk about like some stuff you've done you really want people to see mostly if you check my twitter out which is rachel with ael underscore nis but then i tend to share all my news and stuff there if you want to follow me and loads of tidbits about stuff through the Italian horror. Um, I'm just trying to think what I've done what I've done recently. Yeah, I would say check out the Mondo Macabro release of Pensione Pora because I was really happy to do that commentary with Peter and I think it's a good one. So yeah, I'd recommend the film. Um, what else have I done? I did a, a piece on the production design in The Laughing Women. Yes. Which I would recommend checking out because it's such a cool, stylish film. And yeah, the commentary is Nothing Underneath, Madness. Um, oh shit, not Madness. <laughs> Well, you really, you really want that to happen. <laughs> and nothing too beautiful to die. Too, nothing underneath too beautiful to die, and the killer is still among us. Yeah. Oh, you also wrote a piece for the phenomena, the recent phenomena release. I did a piece on um, Armani's fashions and phenomena, and I talk a bit about the world and phenomena and how they kind of inform what's going on in Argento's kind of vision of um, uh, Switzerland if the Nazis won World War II. <laughs> Which is crazy, because, you know, he has these things that he hides in his movies. Like, I love Tenebre is supposed to be, like, this uh, post-plague, post-apocalypse, so there's not many people around yeah. anymore, so murders are much more shocking. Yeah, when you know that, it's like, it makes sense. The same kind of with um, phenomena and the, the Nazi thing. It's not overt there, but, like, once you're told that, you're like, oh, I can see, like, how he's done that, which is what I really like about Argento. And sometimes people go, oh, like, you can be over analytical about these films, which, sure, of course you can, and I probably am. But then you hear little tidbits like that, and you're like, actually, yeah, there is other stuff that's not as obvious that's lurking beneath the surface. And I'm sure he's, you know, he's a little tired sometimes and might make movies that don't have a lot of subtext, but that's mm-hmm. why we're here to have 
fun talking about it. Yeah, sometimes you just like them for what they are, and it's just fun to discuss them and all the craziness that's going on. Yeah. So, yeah to sum up, folks, Rachel's busy. That's why this took a while to coordinate. <laughs> but I'm glad we made it. This was an awesome time. Thank you. Yeah, I'm usually busy in some sort of Italian newspaper archive, like oh, trying to so find cool. some information. And if, if this if this question doesn't, if you don't want to answer this question, I'll just cut it. Um, so are there more episodes of Fragments of Fear coming soon? Yeah, there are, right? So we've had a break that's gone on like I couldn't believe when I checked like how many months it's been since our last episode. Things keep going wrong. I broke my elbow oh. and I had yeah, and I had two operations and then Peter was sick. Peter had COVID and then oh. like family stuff and this and that. So it feels like every week, like last week, we were gonna record our episode on Two Faces of Fear. And then we were actually we were supposed to do it the week before that in the week. So and we were gonna do Blood Link and then we switched to Two Faces of Fear and then we're still not ready, <laughs> but it should be this week coming, touch <laughs> wins. So we're not we're we're not stop like some message me and they're like oh have you stopped it's like no we're just everything keeps going wrong and it doesn't work but <laughs> you know what it's like trying to schedule time with this yes I have I have a, a very busy person with two jobs I've got you know a person that, you know in your uh, time zone I have to coordinate with and uh, oh yes yeah, it's, it's difficult but thank you for thank you for inviting me on this because it's really cool to talk and it's just like have fun with some titles not don't have to prepare like loads of notes and i can't be accused of reading off the script that's good <laughs> hey anyone anyone who claims that talking to me is fun is a friend of mine yeah maybe i just haven't left the flat in a long time <laughs> <laughs> i mean i talk to myself every day and i'm sick of me <laughs> <laughs> especially in the shower i don't know why it's like just having a full conversation oh we should have recorded this oh fuck i know like shower i think i would like all my best works on the shower like all my best <laughs> ideas for things i'm working on so maybe i just need to like set up record like not recording actual recording you know what i mean a microphone not a video camera when I was a kid, I used to stay up all night because I was scared of bullies at school and I would just write yeah. comebacks that never happened because they never said the exact phrase I needed them to say oh, so for my comeback. That's why I sleep like eight hours a night as an adult because I never slept as a kid. That's how I caught so many cool movies in the middle of the night because I was sneaking, sneaking being awake. Oh, that's awful. You were up all night worrying about it. That's, I think that even as adults, don't we do that still, like fictional arguments? I drew, I have arguments all the time in my dreams with people. You gotta turn it off. That's like, that's why I'm able to sleep. I don't, I think about, I've been writing the same novel for since 2002. As soon as I start thinking about it, I'm out. Like, I immediately pass out because my book's so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like every night, like multiple times a night, I'll dream of having arguments with people. And I wake up exhausted. I'm like, oh my God. I know, dude. You've been waiting to tell yeah. me off for 10 years. <laughs> and you blew it. I actually had a, I had a dream about recording this podcast. I yes. Anxiety dream about it. Night Killer 2, the podcasting. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. <laughs> Folks, take care. And Rachel, thank you again. Thank you. It was good for chatting. Bye, folks. Bye. Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or Go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello This Is The Doom Show, use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette.